is emptiness, clarity, and love. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that only gets halfway through the chapter, but I thought it was enough <laughs> to get us started. And my hope is when we get into talking more about the meditation is that we'll actually take a tour of those three qualities. I think knowing that those are qualities is one thing, understanding them at an, uh, maybe kind of more academic level, it's really important. What does that mean, emptiness, clarity, and love? How does that constitute our innate spark, our Buddha nature? But feeling it, of course, that's what we're all after. How can we identify and then really embody that experience of empty, emptiness, clarity, and love? So that is our plan. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share, if I can, this, this one screen, um, which is the only screen that you will look at tonight, but really wanting to have us on the same page around being here together in this online format in this I can't remember, infinity week of the pandemic, <laughs> like a million years that we've been in this. Uh, there's been so much evolution of what it means to be in online spaces together. And wanna kind of highlight some of the opportunities we have to work on our core spiritual qualities together. So these core spiritual qualities or paramitas, this is a way that we can think of how do we wanna show up to be together in community? How do we wanna show up with the teachings? So the first one here is discipline. Um, and this idea, this is a hard one of really giving ourselves the discipline to be fully here when we're together in this space. And that means as much as possible, unless you have family members or otherwise who need you, to really just focus only on what we're doing here. And part of that that can be really supportive is to have your camera on. I do not need you to look at the screen. I, I totally can relate and empathize with the fatigue of screen time, but you could maybe place it so that you're in profile or even place it a little bit towards the ceiling. But that helps us really take on that commitment of I'm fully here. I'm not kind of here, but also feeding my cat or kind of here, but rearranging some of my furniture. Um, and I say this because I do that. Um, and so I want you to make the choice. Either I'm showing up tonight, but I actually don't have maybe the discipline or the um, desire to show up fully. No problem, make that choice. But if you would like to show up fully, I really encourage you to engage with that um, through having some way of being seen um, and holding yourself accountable to your, to your fellow Sangha here. And this overlaps beautifully with generosity. You know, giving yourself to this time completely, giving yourself to one another completely. I have another, a number of prompts I want us to think about and, and reflect on together. And so that is really important of really showing up fully. Uh, this idea of non-harming may be the quintessential practice of everything we do. Can we have more and more and more and more non-harming? That means in our speech, in our body, in our mind, in all the things we are doing. And especially as we show up here together in a, in a temporary community. We're so fortunate that we have some of us on this call who we do know each other. We have a relationship. Um, and for some of us, it's our first time joining in the community tonight. And so I want us all as a community to consider this principal core value. Everyone here is welcome. Everyone here can feel engaged because we are all enacting in the same values. And that value and goal is we do the least amount of harm possible to ourselves and others. So that's just such a beautiful one for us to keep in mind in our practice together. Oh, patience. Uh, no one's favorite and definitely, I mean, if they had a pill that could teach you patience, it would be the, like, the most, you know, popular and expensive pill on the market. It is so hard for us in these times to maintain patience with some of the pretty normal frustrations. I actually lost power a couple hours ago and was worried, oh my God, am I gonna be able to teach from my house tonight? Where can I go? Everything is of course quarantined. Um, and so patience with some of the normal kind of hiccups of being together in an online format. And lastly, and definitely not least, Joyful enthusiasm. 
we are here together with the teachings. How lucky are we? And to really have that sense of, um, wow, what might possibly be ignited in me tonight towards my path to awakening? We just never know. It might just be looking at Mesa's cat that it really ignites us towards awakening in ways we never realized. I mean, look how much compassion that elicits. <laughs> okay, so that's my last screen here. Um, so just one more time, really wanting to gaze upon you all and welcome you. Welcome, 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 welcome. So happy you are here. So happy we are together. And taking a moment yourselves to just check out who's here and look at them with welcoming care and consideration. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm Eve Ekman. And oh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that um, we had a little bit of a miscommunication. Tig O'Malley will be with me next week teaching. Um, so if you got the newsletter, uh, Tig has taught with me a number of times. And as those of you who have sat with him know, is such a lovely teacher. I'm really looking forward to us together next week taking on the next part of this chapter, which is all about more and more and more love. So that is really nice. Um, so for this meditation, as I mentioned, we're going to glimpse into emptiness, clarity, and love. And I want to just briefly say that, you know, when I'm saying emptiness here, it's really this idea of objectless attention. So we're going to have a sense of spaciousness of our own mind and, and watching things come and watching things go. This open presence means that it's not as though emptiness is some kind of void state. It's an emptying of or emptying ourselves of other holding on to preoccupations, other sensations, other things that would kind of occlude whatever is naturally there. And the clarity, clarity is just, it's such a beautiful aspect of our innate Buddha nature or our spark to focus on. This clarity is really the cognizance, the knowing. It's what allows us to have some sort of insight into our own experience, to recognize our habits and patterns, and it's also really creates this luminous, calm, and transparent state of mind. So we'll be looking towards that. And love, the essence love, as Sukhni Rinpoche calls it, is this tender, unbiased openness towards all beings, starting with us. So that will be our tour. And it's, um, you know, it's, I think, very meaningful for us to really consider how we can come into a practice position right now that's supportive. Um, if you're like me, you might have spent a number of hours already today in front of a screen, uh, maybe sitting. I am one who is a big supporter of supine position. If, and you're at home, you even know the floor is clean, or if it's unclean, it's your unclean. So I totally invite you to engage in supine position. Uh, as many of you know, the Buddha really recommended a couple different positions for meditating. That includes sitting, walking, and lying down. And so for lying down practice, really allowing yourself to lie down in a comfortable position, you can think of it as a shavasana or corpse pose in which your palms are up. So let's begin, all of us, by finding a position that really can support our practice. Let's begin our practice together this evening by focusing in on relaxing through the eyes and the eyelids. Softening and melting any tension between the eyebrows. And feel or imagine a softness 
as the lids are touching one another. Invite all the muscles in the face to relax and release. And do this with a lot of intention and a lot of attention. So inviting each and every area to simply surrender and release. And doing so with the intention of real kindness. Letting go for this moment anything needed through the muscles in the face. And expanding this kind attention through the top of the head, the back of the head, and around the neck. Invite a feeling of cascading energy, releasing, submitting, traveling down from the face and the head all the way to the floor beneath you. And feeling that energy continue to cascade from the collarbone down over the breasts, the ribs and the belly and over the shoulder blades the upper and lower black back. And all this energy, <clears throat> maybe even tension or tightness, is being completely absorbed by the earth beneath you. And for a couple moments, notice what it feels like throughout the entire body to be breathing. Of course, our breath is only through the nostrils and in the lungs. And yet, notice with this close, kind attention, wherever you can feel sensation in the body, as the gentle inhale fills the belly, and as it deflates through the exhale. Attend closely to the sensations of the body breathing from within the body. And when the mind wanders, of course it will. Let your first response be to relax. Then to release whatever has captured your attention and return rejoicing in this renewed opportunity to be in the breathing body, noticing sensations of the breathing body.
And here, from this place of somewhat stabilized attention, consider a meaningful intention for being here this evening. Our intention is what creates the meaning in our life, helps us transform and aspire. Consider an intention that is befitting of this evening. What was your purpose for coming here? What is your aspiration? It could be curiosity, connection, Find a simple word or phrase and really highlight it, refine it, make it clear and vivid. And then gently release that intention the word or phrase, and return again to noticing the body. We transition now to this first part of our practice, this practice of emptiness. And we'll attend merely to noticing our awareness and whatever arises within. We can do so with our eyes closed or slightly open. And the object of our attention here is actually the openness of our awareness. Noticing that, of course, thoughts will come, but we don't engage or indulge. Sensations will arise. See if you can notice the very beginning of an itch. Notice it simply as sensation. See if you can notice right before the desire to blink and then notice blinking. Here we cultivate this open presence with whatever arises, free from our judgments or preferences. Here we may gain just a momentary glimpse of that vast, spacious emptiness. As you attend closely to the mind, you may notice an internal dialogue or speech. And simply see if you can make space around that. If you find yourself just incredibly dull, tired, and lethargic, 
Allow yourself the refreshment of focusing on the inhale, finding the vividness and clarity there. Otherwise, invite yourself to completely empty out. in this form of shamatha or attention practice, instead of attending to the breath or feelings, we are attending to the space of awareness. And what we may notice when we get a glimpse of really sustaining ourselves in that vast space of our own awareness, is there is a natural brightness There is a knowing without thinking. The vastness of our mind isn't just dull emptiness. See if you can notice the mind's natural luminosity, clarity, brightness. As we focus simply in this open presence, this open awareness, you may notice a sense of ease. 
You may find that this ease is not relegated to the head or behind the eyes and between the ears. But this open presence and awareness may not even be relegated to the body. Whenever anything captures your attention, relax, make space, and return to a vividness, a brightness of attention. And then gently, if your eyes have been open, closing your eyes, moving inward to focus on the felt experience of the body, of the breath. And ask yourself this simple question. What does my heart long for? And allowing yourself to tenderize and be so gentle with whatever is evoked by that question. And continue softly and gently repeating that question to yourself and noticing what arises, what tenderness and feelingfulness in the heart can be felt. And continue to open up towards, gently, whatever are the feelings in the heart. You can release the question. 
And simply notice the felt sensation and meet it with gentleness. For a moment, imagine as though you could radiate this tenderness of your heart out in all directions. All this raw material of longing, of caring. Forging this common human experience together. And then gently bringing your attention towards that which holds your heart gently. That innate capacity, that basic goodness and caring. These unconfigured states of emptiness, clarity, and love are our true nature. I'd love to see <clears throat> in the chat from folks anything you noticed. Could be a single word, could be a sentence. What did you notice in that <clears throat> exploration of your emptiness, your clarity, your love? So Sokni Rinpoche calls this true nature, our, our Buddha nature, he calls it our spark. And that this spark has these three components, this comp these components of emptiness, clarity, and love. I see people saying here they felt tenderness, and refuge, Stillness, guilt, yeah. Sense of the sameness and loving others, flowing and spacious. So Sokni Rinpoche, he says that this, the translation of the Sanskrit words that have to do with our Buddha nature. So the 
Tafe Garbarta. <laughs> Pronouncing that terribly. That's the difference between Chandra and I. Her pronunciation of Tibetan words, excellent. Uh, that it's really this idea of our true nature is when we have gone beyond or gone to bliss. And it's not that we've transcended this world. It's not that we no longer have a feeling or connection here, but we've gone beyond the conflict, the aversion, everything that's in the way of that emptiness, that clarity, and that sense of love. So I think it's interesting the way uh, that he describes emptiness here. He says, emptiness is a rough translation of the Sanskrit word shunyata, and the Tibetan word tongpanyi. The basic meaning of the Sanskrit word is zero, an infinitely open space or background that allows for anything to appear. The Tibetan word tongpa means empty, but not in the sense of a vacuum or a void, but in the sense of a basis of experience that is beyond our ability to perceive with our senses, to describe, to name, or to capture in a nice tidy concept. Maybe a better understanding of the deep sense of the word may be inconceivable or unnameable. I'm curious from, from folks, um, this sense of emptiness, it, it is really, <laughs> um, it can be so hard to capture, so hard to really feel as an embodied experience. And did, did anybody have a sense that they could, um, that they could share in the chat of really some actual taste of emptiness. And I know it's beyond words. <laughs> so maybe you could just say, yes, there was some sense of emptiness or no, I really was hard time to feel it. <laughs> so Pamela had a little bit and Mace, not very much. You know, that form of emptiness, it doesn't need to be cultivated through a meditation practice. We can definitely glimpse it naturally when we are somewhere sitting, we happen to not have our phone, there's nothing distracting in front of us, and we have just a sense of total openness. And this, this gets really interesting here. When you start to look at the mind or study the mind, there's a lot that we can understand about different mind states. So within even mind wandering, there's some mind wandering that's very creative, it's generative, but still not emptiness. There's some mind wandering that's very ruminative and negative, and maybe not surprisingly, extremely focused on the future. <laughs> Also not emptiness, right? But with both of those, we're, we're not engaging with our environment, right? We're not noticing what's going on in the chat. What am I listening to? What am I hearing? So we've kind of withdrawn into the space of our mind, but not into the vast spaciousness of our mind. So I think to really be able to start having a sense of emptiness, we have to become familiar with all of our mind states. To really get curious of, what is my mind actively doing or not doing? So when I have that moment of, and many of us are doing a lot of this, washing the dishes. <laughs> what is my mind doing as I wash the dishes? Am I focused on actually the soap and the, you know, the dirt or whatever it is on our plate? Am I thinking about what's happening next? Am I thinking about what happened before? Am I actually here doing this, but with some space? So to really start investigating and moving towards finding emptiness, not just when all the conditions are right. When I, I like that someone wrote this, when our neighbors are quiet, when we have the right cushion, when you know the temperature is good, we had just enough food, but we're not too hungry, we're not too full, right? Can we find that emptiness anywhere? The answer would be absolutely like a hundred percent, it can always be here with us. It doesn't have to be this uh, really um, idealistic thing that we move towards. So uh, we're just reading here, a sense of emptiness came and went. Beautiful, beautiful. 
these glimpses of emptiness it is really what we get in our practice. Of course, we can get it on, on our day to day as well, kind of moving through again, washing the dishes or other activities, but even having those glimpses of our emptiness, that can give us a lot of insight. If we are completely locked in and tied into our thoughts, it's a very different way of being. So, you know, again, like many of you all, if we are in meetings all day <laughs> on these WebEx platforms or Zoom or whatever, we're in meetings all day, it's actually really hard to find emptiness because we're really engaged. There's something happening, we're looking, we're receiving. Um, maybe we have a moment where we can have our gaze upward, find ourselves, pour all of our awareness and attention back into ourselves before re-engaging. But it's true that the pace of our everyday life doesn't give us a lot of opportunity for emptiness. We have to be very deliberate about it. It has to be cultivated. Um, so another aspect here <laughs> is, you know, this emptiness can really give us a kind of relief of a sense of, of who we think we need to be and who we are. So often you'll hear teachers talk about emptiness as the emptiness of any kind of intrinsic or inherent form, anything, of, anything lasting. So this idea of our role, who we are in this world, when we can insert some emptiness in it, it doesn't mean that we, you know, again, become total nihilists, like nothing matters. But it means that we recognize that nothing matters at the level of often our self-absorbed tendency to think the world is about us. Honestly, it's interesting. I, I have the opportunity to teach <clears throat> in a lot of secular settings. And there's a lot of amazing techniques that can be applied to help us reduce some of our daily stress, our difficult emotions. But if you want to go to the root, the very root of what creates most of our mental disturbance, a lot of it has to do with our overinflated sense of self. And not just that we think we're so great, we also think we're so terrible, right? Two sides, through two different sides of the same coin. But also this way in which we can't see the fact that all these ideas about ourselves are very useful and naturally created projections. Right? And so some of the instructions on how do we see the emptiness of form, we imagine as though this life were like a dream. And in a dream, everything seems totally real, but it's a projection of our mind. So can we see the dreamlike nature of our reality? Is that one way to help us find that emptiness in the everyday? <clears throat> There's a quote here that was shared in the newsletter um, this week from this chapter. It says, um, a simplistic understanding of emptiness, a point of view that nothing has any meaning, is too oversimplified. The actual teachings on emptiness imply an infinitely open space that allows for anything to appear, change, disappear, and reappear. The basic meaning of emptiness, in other words, is openness or potential. At the basic level of our being, we are empty of definable characteristics. We are not defined by our past, our present, or our thoughts and feelings about the future. We have the potential to experience anything, and anything can refer to thoughts, feelings, and sensations. I think, you know, in this moment of living through our pandemic experience, it can feel very dense. It can feel like it is the only reality. And even though it's an uncertain one, it's almost hard for us to see outside of it. This idea or this glimpse of emptiness, can we apply this to some of our maybe emotional responses to this pandemic and how it's transformed a lot of our lives, a lot of our expectations about how we live? I found that really useful uh, in reading and rereading this chapter to think about how does this matter now? And the cool thing, as many of you know about these teachings is they were completely designed for times like this when we get to see revealed so clearly 
the uncertain nature of reality all around us. So it's really interesting to think of how can we include or insert emptiness into our everyday life, into even our moment to moment opportunities to have that when we get a break from our persistent attending towards or our mind wandering and imagination. So before we move on to clarity, I'd like to know, are there questions on emptiness? Questions on this kind of intrinsic nature for us? In the chat would be, would be wonderful if that's possible. So nice that this next section is on clarity and its luminous nature. And right outside my window, I see the luminous moon. Maybe some of you can see it as well. It's full tomorrow. Creates such a nice reminder of that brilliance and brightness and beauty. Okay. Does emptiness feel far away for you guys? Does it feel like, uh, <laughs> I don't think the moon is possible to show. It's a little too weirdly angled. Um, does it feel, does it feel actually relatable? Like that can be applied into your everyday life? Yeah. Who doesn't get emptiness at all? I've been taught that emptiness goes hand in hand with dependent arising. Is that your understanding? Yeah, absolutely. When we have a sense of, um, again, that nothing exists as solid, Nothing, I am not always Eve as daughter, as a teacher, um, as partner, that these are all contingent. You know, everything that is, everything that is arising is dependent on other causes and conditions. And for me, what I really think of with emptiness that, that helps me over and over is just remembering impermanence, that everything is changing and shifting. Nothing is forever. Nothing is something we can hold on to indefinitely. And it's interesting because in this chapter, he's really talking about emptiness, not as a view that we create, but as an innate characteristic that's already within us. So we can have two different kinds of teachings on emptiness, or probably more than two. But in that case, when we learn about emptiness, when we apply our mind to include emptiness, it helps us transform the way we interact with the world. With a glimpse of emptiness, it's harder to get upset when our favorite mug breaks, right? And it's like, oh, that mug, I got it at this amazing shop and it was made by this potter and oh, right? And with our view of emptiness, it's a, it's a bit easier to say, oh, it was just a form, it was here, it's, it's now past. But that's a little different than feeling for ourselves emptiness as part of our, our, our essential nature. And I think about it this way. What, again, what is the opposite of the mind and feeling empty? <laughs> it's the mind incredibly preoccupied with ruminative thought. And so I think my, my invitation to you all is investigate the part of your mind where it isn't ruminating on the past or the future, when it isn't in direct engagement with others. You know, it's very hard to have emptiness when you're conversing with someone. You're so aroused and interested. There's so much at a physiological level going on that really keeps you engaged. Um, other question here, feels like a refuge. <clears throat> I guess I feel it more as spaciousness. Yeah, I, I think that there, the, the, in, the inherent quality that is described with emptiness is spaciousness or vastness. And then we get to the next aspect of, of this clarity. And, you know, um, I'll just read here. He says, clarity is the cognizant aspect of our nature, a very simple capability for awareness. The basic or natural awareness is merely a potential. Just as emptiness is a capacity to be anything, Clarity is the capacity to see anything. I'll say that one more time. Emptiness is a capacity to be anything. We're not confined to one thing or another. There is infinite potential. 
And clarity is the capacity to see anything. And you know, this clarity, it's so interesting. This, the way that it's described over and over in ancient texts is this luminous quality, the ose wela. And I, you know, again, I always associate luminous with the moon. And do I find my mind like the moon? Not really, <laughs> you know? And so I'm, I'm really, you know, of course words fail and they're, they are quite literally just pointing out what it is we're trying to experience directly. And yet it's really interesting to kind of shed light on our experience. That is what clarity does. The clarity highlights. So if we have this vast openness of our emptiness, how do we know anything? How do we actually become aware of phenomena that are arising naturally? So I think what's um, you know, interesting to think about again is what is the opposite of our clarity? It would be either having a lot of dullness so we have this vast spaciousness where we're kind of like, blah, like zoned out, you know, when you're really sleep deprived and it's really spacious, but you're really exhausted. There's no clarity. Um, we can also have a lack of clarity if we're just having too many like hyperactive thoughts here, there, other, where, all over, you know, which is described to most of us throughout our day, <laughs> right? Um, and we might be attending, we might feel like there's some kind of focus but there isn't the clarity. So it's really, again, trying to get uh, deeply into this um, aspect of what these are together. Emptiness and clarity are indivisible. Basically, if you're capable of everything, one of those capabilities is the ability to be aware, to see, to know, or to recognize whatever you experience. You can't separate emptiness from clarity anymore then you can separate wetness from water or heat from fire. Your essential nature, your Buddha nature, isn't just unlimited in its potential to be. It is also awake and alert to the various forms of experience life may take. So here he really starts to highlight the fact that our clarity is also a way that we become aware of our habits and patterns, our ways of being in the world. So in that meditative practice, we weren't doing a deep inquiry. We weren't saying, oh, here's that ruminative thought about something that happened to me in the past again. Why is that happening? But our clarity is what allows us to examine more clearly what is happening in our mind. What are these ongoing habits and patterns of our life? And um, the idea that he says here is that if we are to become aware of each of our patterns rather than carried away with them, their power will fade. Able to experience their appearance as nothing more than a combination of factors, similar to the factors that cause waves to come and grow, go across a lake or a pond or an ocean. So here he's really talking about kind of causes and conditions. And the fact that when we look closely at our experiences, we realize it's not as, not as cut and dry as, it's some, as we sometimes make it out to be. One amazing example is always anger. <laughs> when we feel frustrated and angry, often we feel certain and right. And our clarity can help us see our role in it. Not only our role in it, but kind of the contextual factors. Our role in it may just be according to some, our karmic momentum, the ways in which we have reacted to the world and responded to the world that have become a true habit. We feel as though the world is out to get us and we respond in that way. It's our clarity that we apply to help us kind of disentangle the solidity of that way of being. In psychology, we'd call that our internal working model, our way of seeing and being and responding to the world. So I think our clarity can also really help us transform or begin to transform some of these habits and patterns that are just so intrinsic to the way that we think on a day-to-day -day basis. When we start to look at clarity and emptiness together, we realize that we have the ingredients to start kind of pulling apart the realities that keep us unhappy. Often this is described as the mind of hope and fear. 
our hope that things will be better, our fear that things will get worse. And when we see the world through the lens of hope and fear, instead of emptiness and clarity, then we see things as kind of threatening and personal towards us. And that really creates a full time, a full lifetime worth of activity. The problem essentially with the mind of hope and fear is it gets us caught in that ongoing cycle of wanting things to be different. I think it's really interesting again for us to look at this now. I would say almost all of us, I, I can't speak for everyone in our unique circumstances, but almost all of us, they really, we really want things to be different right now. We want them to be different. Maybe we want to hug people we care about. Maybe we want to have security in our job. Maybe we want to have a sense of just being able to have freedom in our movements and not be afraid of illness for ourselves or our loved ones. And we can create a good deal of suffering, ongoing, all day, and even wake us up in the night suffering, just because we want it to be different than it is. We're afraid of how things could get worse. We keep hoping things will get better. And here we really see the, the mind of hope and fear in action. It doesn't mean when we accept emptiness and clarity that we then think that nothing has any meaning or purpose, that we become nihilistic, that we don't try to make changes. Of course, we try to make changes, but we don't do so with so much pressure, with so much intensity, as feeling as though we could control anything. That's been our big opportunity for, for many of us in this time is how goddamn little control we have. Always true, now very revealed for us. Um, okay, I see a question here. Buddha equals emptiness, Dharma equals clarity, Sangha equals love. Ooh, I like that. Interesting idea. Okay. Um, and, then, so, and then a question on can you say anything about appropriate anger? <laughs> um, oh boy, can I. <laughs> um, I'd say I'm a lifelong student of appropriate anger. Um, as many of us, I grew up with a certain configure of anger in my household. Um, and there was a lot of it and I didn't want anything to do with it. So from my experience, I'll speak from my experience, I learned that anger was something I was really afraid of. And if it showed up, I got really nervous. I just, you know, I'm one of those conflict avoidant types. I'm outed. Um, and guess what? It gets you in just as much trouble as being an aggressively outward person. Um, both are inappropriate forms of anger. Not okay to lose it and ex over express your anger. Also not okay to avoid anger at every turn. Can I get an amen, everybody? Yes, no, not okay, thank you. <laughs> and you know, my favorite form of poorly expressed anger uh, is passive aggressivity. That's really a winner. Oh yeah, people love it, totally, totally works for everybody. Uh, <laughs> I see some hand raises. <laughs> oh boy. So our appropriate expressed anger, I think there's only one rule of thumb, and that is when we are not acting in the moment or the grip of our anger. So anger, like every single emotion, it has such an important message for us. Sometimes the message relates to, as Sukhni Rinpoche said in his first chapter, something that is real but not true. So what I'm getting angry about right now might have to relate to a whole pattern of thinking and believing that comes from my earliest childhood experiences. And if you dig deep, you will realize so many of your inappropriate adult emotional experiences have these kind of like long tails, let's say. They go far back. So when we are not reacting in the moment, we're giving ourselves an opportunity to really discover what is the message of this anger. Is it real and true right now? Is it real, meaning it feels real, of course, I feel angry, but is it true? Does it relate to this situation? Let's say, um, let's say we feel left out. We find out that our friends had a Zoom party and no one invited us. And we're like so pissed. I had a Zoom party last week and I invited them. What the F is wrong with them, right? And so this anger arises and we're gonna go about 
you know, sending a passively aggressive angry text, like, hope you had fun, <laughs> heard it was great, <laughs> right? Whatever is your mode, um, or you explosively, you know, in red bold caps, tell someone that you're angry by text. Um, and what we don't realize is this, we have this heightened sense of being left out. That was how we felt so early on in our life. That is such a predisposed feeling for us. And we miss out on the fact that then we get the text right back, which says, oh, but you said you were teaching a class. So I didn't want to interfere. And I want to make you feel like you were missing out. This didn't happen, but this could likely happen to me, right? So it's like, oh man, they were being thoughtful. They didn't want me to have FOMO. And I'm like losing it thinking they, you know, whatever. So there's one example. Even if our anger is real and true, meaning we are frustrated and feeling left out and we were, there is an appropriate way to communicate our needs that can only happen when we're not in the grip of our anger. It's not gonna happen in the moment. Our physiological response is really set up for us to aggress and fight. Right? Our anger, at a, at a, in the terms of our evolutionary basis of it, is so that we can meet a very formidable threat and kind of gnash our way through. We just don't, we don't need that for most of our everyday anger, right? We really don't. So can we take our, like the whole practice of um, especially mindfulness and attention training is so that we become aware of these emotions as they arise, so that we can have that opportunity to take the break, to suppress momentarily, to give ourselves like even those 30 to 90 seconds so that our physiological arousal can start to come down, we can see more clearly, we can have some sort of plan and choice. Okay, great question. You can always ask me about anger. Um, so before we, um, before we move on, to love, which, you know, we could spend the next six nights on. Um, any more questions on clarity and emptiness and maybe how this might be integrated, um, especially to right now? Okay. Please feel, continue to write questions into the chat here. So, Sokni Rinpoche, uh, I call him, um, I call him my heart teacher. I have a root teacher, Alan Wallace. I have my teacher teacher, Jennifer Wellwood. He is my heart teacher because he really taught me um, more than any teacher ever how to live in my heart. And the way that he talks about love and essence love, I find it really transformative. Um, many teachers talk about these topics and I really hope I can do him a little bit of justice in communicating just the, I'd say the, the real embodied understanding of the importance of this. <clears throat> he says in this book, and, and I've heard him speak about this in, um, in retreat as well, that, um, Love wasn't something he focused on when he was teaching in India and Nepal. That felt that it was very natural for many of his students there, that there was a generosity and a kindness that it didn't really, it, he didn't need to emphasize this aspect of love. However, the attention and clarity, that's what he was going for. He was really teaching clarity and emptiness and, and trainings one attention. However, when he started teaching in the West or in the modern context, I, I really hesitate to say the West again, because whether you're in Hong Kong or um, Pakistan or Ireland, um, most of us have this different consciousness associated with modernity and capitalism. So in our modern society and culture, um, he found that all, a lot of his students were really good at the attention part, at like developing clarity and getting really into that and really applying themselves ardently but that his students could barely sustain their attention because of all the intense emotions arising during their practice so he'd be on retreat in the first couple days people would be efforting really hard gosh they were trying just as much as they could to focus but all the 
undigested emotional material was arising and they, they had no way to manage it. And I would just knock them off their practice. And so he really shifted into teaching way more explicitly on love. Thank God. Um, it is so needed. It is so helpful. Um, and he says, um, this Tibetan term for love, uh, which is often translated as compassion, but the Ning Jie indicates something much more profound. Ning is one of the Tibetan words for heart, and Jie means noble or lord in the sense of a ruler or the highest. So taken together, these two words suggest that the highest or most noble type of heart a profound experience and expression of connectedness that's completely unencumbered by attachments or conditions. So many of us, of course, <laughs> we think of love in romantic love terms. And romantic love is great, um, you know, uh, when it's good. Um, it's also bad when it's bad. Um, but with a lot of our romantic love, it does operate on this contingent model this conditional model. In some ways, a transactional model. I love you because you love me. And if you don't love me the way I love you, I'm not gonna love you back, right? There's a real currency in exchange. And that is not the kind of love of our spiritual practice or our innate nature. Um, he says, <clears throat> we don't recognize that there's something fundamentally tragic in the conditions we place upon the giving and receiving of love. We accept the love as commodity approach as normal, because quite frankly, it is in the sense that it reflects a level of understanding and behavior that is commonly, if not always consciously, adopted by millions of people around the world. But just because a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving is common doesn't mean it's constructive. And so he really invites us here to confront and think about the ways in which we have engaged with love with others. And um, myself <laughs> and many people I know have, I think, felt amidst heartbreak, right? We've been in one of our situations of heartbreak with a loved one and maybe a breakup. And there's a sense of, you know, I give up. This love thing is not for me. This is too much. I'm just gonna be a bodhisattva and care about all other beings. But this like romantic love thing, no. It's fundamentally flawed. It doesn't work. I can't make it work. And what he kind of <laughs> um, pokes at or suggests in this is, if you cannot make it work with another person, you definitely can't make it work for all beings. That's hard. <laughs> I think that's hard. Um, right? It really, it's a real confrontation. Um, and of course, you know, whoever you are in love with is your teacher. We all know that. Showing you all your most broken parts and things that don't work. Um, every day, every moment of the day. Um, that's not true. But, uh, you know, they definitely, there definitely is that mirror aspect. But he goes on to say <clears throat> that if we can't love another person, we can't hope to be a bodhisattva and available for others. But we can't get there if we don't have this solid foundation in ourselves. And that almost sounds trite to say. I mean, it is said so many times you can't love another person unless you love yourself. Um, but it's true. <laughs> but it's not love yourself in that romantic, conditional way. And I think most of us are actually inadvertently loving ourselves when we're good. Loving ourselves when we fulfill some expectation that we have of ourselves. And we're, that means that we're missing out on our unconditional, unconditioned love for ourselves. This capacity he's talking about here is a love that is totally irrespective of what we did right or what we did wrong. And for many of us, we have never experienced that. We've never actually had that modeled to us. Or maybe we just don't remember. Maybe one of our parents was like that when we were really young. Maybe. Maybe some of us have had it and that is awesome shine your light in the world. But, but for many of us, it's not something we're familiar with. 
So how do we know it for ourselves? How can we know it for ourselves? And I do think, you know, we can start just like we only have glimpses of that emptiness through our meditation. We can have glimpses of that kind of unconditioned love for ourselves, Where we just feel good about being us. He calls it basic okayness. Chogyam Trumpa calls it basic goodness. But he's like, mm, no, basic okayness. And that may not feel to you like love, but it is, it's the foundation for us to then build and build more gentleness. And I really like, he uses that word a lot, gentleness with ourselves, gentleness. Um, I think that for many of us, it feels easier to invite gentleness than to invite love. Um, okay, I'm gonna read one little quote here. He said that <clears throat> when we've been disappointed many times by not being fulfilled by someone else, we lose hope that we can ever experience love in any form and we can withdraw altogether. That hopelessness, which may be called a wounded love, can set in at a very early age. It can also grow over time and then it ends up closing us off to any person who might be able to come into our life with the love we seek. Oh, Zoom bombing. He always is doing this. He really, he needs the teachings on love, or he is maybe the teacher of love. Thank you for your presence here. Okay. So he says that the kind of love that we are actually trying to cultivate and seek is an openness that clarity offers uh, sorry, an openness. It's a clarity. It offers every one of us the possibility to experience a tender, unbiased openness towards every living being without conditions, without preconceptions. That's a really nice aspiration. <laughs> it's a really nice aspiration. An unbiased openness towards every living being without conditions and without preconceptions. The conditions part, again, it really, I just find it, it's heartbreaking. All the conditions we put on ourselves in order to feel like we deserve love. And then, of course, that we see, we project onto others to be deserving of our love. Um, okay, so I have another question here. How do we want to be virtuous and improve ourselves while also loving, unconditionally accepting? Wonderful question. Um, um, yeah, and I think, um, thank you for that. My cat does really love me. It might be a conditional love having to do with the fact that I opened the cat food. Um, but I think there's more. Um, this really interesting, I would say, in some ways, um, kind of like edge of the blade of really accepting ourselves as we are and loving ourselves and engaging in wanting to continue to improve ourselves and push ourselves. The cool thing is there has been in the, in the field of self-compassion, a lot of that research has shown that self-compassion doesn't make us more apathetic. It doesn't make us less productive. In fact, quite the opposite. That when we have that foundation of love for ourselves, we're unencumbered by all that negativity, that self-criticism, because that negativity and self-criticism, it actually shuts us down. Some of the research um, I may have mentioned here before around how our feelings, our positive feelings, our generative feelings, our good feelings, they actually help us broaden and build. So the researcher Bar Barbara Fredrickson talks about that when we feel these so-called enjoyable emotions, when they feel good, that we're also able to seek out new opportunities, make connections, be collaborative, and have creativity. When we're too busy beating ourselves up in order to survive, <laughs> right? That kind of perfectionist quality many of us are adherent to because we think it's what makes us successful. Um, that when that happens, 
we're not actually really seeing the full landscape of possibilities. So that's been well researched. And I think it's just, um, I think it's a really good mindset for us to get into. By loving myself more, I'm gonna be more productive. By loving myself more, more people are gonna like me. By loving myself more, I'm gonna get more done. So that, cause that's true. Um, as much as anything that is researched is true. But more importantly, of course, is try it out. See if applying more of that unconditional love to yourself makes you less productive. <laughs> or in fact, actually maybe increases your ability to make those cre creative connections and to pursue um, what's needed. Okay, this, this is another beautiful quote. He says, he says so he, he moves here from love to essence love. And he says essence love, you know, it's, it's this kind of like simple term of a way to open our heart unconditionally. Um, and he says, essence love, like emptiness and clarity, stands beyond all the names we call ourselves, all the roles we play in life, son, daughter, father, mother, husband, wife, and so on. It is not something manufactured, nor can it be destroyed. Because it emerges spontaneously from the inseparability of emptiness and clarity, which are themselves uncreated. Okay, one more time, because that sentence is so amazing. It is not something manufactured, nor can it be destroyed, because it emerges spontaneously from the inseparability of emptiness and clarity, which are themselves uncreated. It may be best described as a very basic sense of well being which, if nurtured properly, can extend to a kinship with all living beings. Sign me up. <laughs> I just, you know, um, I really love how he describes there that this, um, this aspect of our innate nature, this love, is not something that is manufactured. It's not like we need to, to generate it through our practice. And it can't be destroyed. It can't be destroyed. No matter how broken your heart is, no matter how much shame you feel, no matter how much anger you feel, it just can't be destroyed because it's completely part of you. Um, <clears throat> and that's not just um, esoteric thinking. You know, if you, if you really look at our, our natural innate capacities for collaboration, for giving, for caring, that is absolutely part of who we are. Um, without that, we would not survive as a species, let alone as an individual. And, you know, I think many of us are really feeling the intense reality of how much we need each other. So what's really interesting is the relationship between, again, our ability to have that unconditioned love for ourselves and then our ability to share that with others. So we can absolutely love other people when we don't love ourselves, But it's not very unconditional. We really, you know, we see that we can get hurt, we can get angry, we get upset, we can question our love for that person. It's a, it's a real contingent kind of love. We see that, of course, when we break up with someone. We love them, we pledge to them, I love you. Like, let's have our life together, our future. You break up with them, I hate them. They're the worst. I never really loved them, right? So what is the kind of love we wanna to cultivate towards others? It means that we also have to have that for ourselves. And it wouldn't like cost anymore, right? It wouldn't, to be able to love someone irrespective of what they do, but to recognize that just like you, they're deserving of love. And it's totally cool to see their special uniqueness and love that too. But that ground is knowing that they are deserving of love just like you. Fundamentally lovable, unconditionally. It's a really nice thought experiment. I was listening to a teaching by my root teacher, Alan Wallace today. And he was talking about a guru, what the relationship is with our gurus or our teachers. And he spent many years with the Dalai Lama. And he said every time he met with the Dalai Lama, he felt as though the Dalai Lama saw the best in him. And to be in the presence of a teacher who sees the best in you. Oof. 
they reflect that to you so that you can then inhabit it. It really moved me. Um, I also had the good fortune to um, spend some time with the Dalai Lama and, and totally, I felt like literally filled up from head to toe with someone who saw so much goodness in me and whose own goodness radiated out. It was such an interesting experience. So imagine if we could all, you know, many of us may feel like, I don't know what to do right now. I don't know how I can help in this pandemic. Um, or, and or, um, I don't even know what I can do for myself. I'm already doing too much. Generating this innate capacity to love unconditionally, oh my gosh, it literally could transform every single person you interact with. Interacting with them with this deep, deep feeling of essence love, unconditional love, unconditioned love. And that's also where our true compassion comes from. When we have compassion for someone for their suffering, it's not because they are suffering, it's because just like us, they are suffering. It's a really different capacity. It's a different sense of connection and kinship. And, you know, I'd say the most popular question slash objection to this idea is that will be too painful. But I invite you to look at how painful separation is. How painful is it to feel that you are different or unlike or somehow not the same as others? That is profoundly painful. I would say the, the pre-pandemic to this pandemic is the pandemic of loneliness in this culture, in this society. Um, so that's my upsell for Essence Love. I think it's enormously important for us. Um, and so this practice that we did, he, he says also <clears throat> that every meditation practice moves us to essence love. Every practice we do moves us to that sense of deep okayness, this fundamental belief that we are good, that we have love that is worth giving, that we are lovable, that we are a being of love. And that instruction that I gave you on, on looking towards. What does your heart long for? That's his instruction on how we get in touch with our essence love. Might be a bit counterintuitive because as someone mentioned in the chat, connecting to what we long for can be painful. We get a sense of, well, what if I long for it and it doesn't happen? So the interesting part of connecting to what we long for is the long game <laughs> is that it's already here. There is nothing that we can truly long for that isn't already here. And that might take quite a bit of real investigation. That's where we really need our clarity. That's where we need to make that emptiness, that spaciousness and recognize what I long for is I want to be recognized in my job or I want to be loved in this certain way. Keep looking, keep looking, keep feeling. Is it already here? So I'm going to invite us to drop back in together with that question one more time. Reconnecting to what our heart longs for. As much as possible, see if you can connect to the, just the very root feeling of that in the body. Maybe an image arises, maybe a specific thought or idea, and let that come and go, and connect just to that sense of longing and yearning. And inviting here that you can just reveal your own innate gentleness towards that longing. Keep looking towards the longing with gentleness. Let it melt, let it tenderize.
open your heart to its longing. And see or imagine if you can find a sense of home in that longing. This isn't somewhere to escape from or avoid. This longing fundamentally is our desire to feel belonging. And allow the heart again to be tender, to be moved with compassion for your own longing. And from there, moved with compassion for all of our longing. And see if you can invite those qualities of emptiness and clarity right here alongside this tender heart of love. Feeling the vastness and openness, the brightness and vividness, the heartfelt quality. Gently infuse the entire body-mind with the inhale and exhale, mixing and mingling these qualities throughout your awareness. And placing your right palm on the heart and the left palm on top of that. Feeling the solidity, the stability, and connection that's right here, always already right here. And considering for a moment, dedicating any glimpse of this connection, of this sense of home. Think of dedicating our time here together that all beings could find clarity, emptiness, and love. All beings could be free. All beings could know the joy of connection. Reflections, any wishes, any ideas. I'll have a, we'll do a little, little kitty cam just for the joy of all beings. He has a heart on his nose, for the record. Yep, that's what he does. <laughs> the name of the book is Open Heart, Open Mind. Maybe we can unmute for a moment and say good evening. Before, before we go, Eve, yeah. can I just thank everyone for being here? Um, I just want to mention that there's a link in the chat 
um, that Mace and Pamela put there to donate if you can. Um, our Sangha uh, is completely community supported. Um, so we're so grateful that everyone can be here regardless of their financial means. And the way that that system works is that uh, people who have resources toss some resources to the Sangha and it enables everyone to be in this beautiful heart space together. So thank you so much, Eve. Thank you all for being here. And um, our all volunteer Sangha could use some more volunteers. So if you're interested in helping out during this all digital bardo time, um, we would really appreciate you sending us an email and we can use help in basically every aspect of things we're doing. We could use at least one more person <laughs> helping us do them. So if you're a you know, if you're a practitioner who is kind and emotionally mature and wants to contribute to the Sangha, um, I'll drop our email address in here and send us an email. And then I hope everyone will join me in thanking Eve and thanking all of you for being here and practicing together. Mm, thanks, Katie. Yeah, highlight of my week every time. It's so awesome to be in the teaching with you all. Yeah. Yeah, unmute yourself, say hi and bye. Hi. Hi. Thank hi. you so much. Hi, everybody. Hey. Thank, Thank you, Eve. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good to